can get started. We've got a lot to cover today, and we have about an hour, and I want to make sure that we leave plenty of time for some Q&A at the end. So first of all, I wanted to thank Jim Jones for taking some time out of his busy schedule to participate in this webinar this afternoon. Uh, one of the things we want to do a little bit differently than a traditional webinar is obviously we have some slides and some content that we want to cover as we walk through the guide, the discussion, but make it a bit more of a discussional uh, presentation here today. So Jim and I are going to be picking up on a few different areas within the presentation and kind of collaborating as we walk through some of the information. We'll also have at the end a discussion session, so a few things that we're going to discuss kind of uh, to get some key takeaways and some insight from Jim uh, through his experience throughout the value harvesting efforts and some of the outcomes. And then, of course, as I mentioned, we'll make sure we save some time for Q&A from the audience. And you can type those in, and we'll take as many as we can. And if we need to, I'll have my contact information of an email address available so you can send in additional ones, and we'll try to answer the ones that we may have not gotten to today. So let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, we'll just go through, through some brief introductions. We'll spend some time just kind of introducing KPIT. We'll go through kind of the opportunity assessment uh, that we looked at for Edward Don at the beginning of this process. We'll talk about what value harvesting is. Some folks have heard of things like value engineering. We'll talk about a little bit of the differences and what value harvesting from uh, an exercise perspective does in, in the process. We'll talk about the specific program uh, that was put in place for Edward Dine. We'll go through some of the results that they've seen. As I mentioned, we'll have a, a discussion and Q&A, and then we'll wrap it up from there. So let's go ahead and get started. So real briefly, for those that may or may not know KPIT, I just wanted to throw this up there real quickly. So we are a global organization that has extensive experience in many technologies and engineering. Uh, I work in our SAP uh, strategic business unit, but we uh, you know, work with you know, different technologies. Uh, some of our recent things that may, uh, you may or may not be aware of is that we were recognized by IDC as one of the leaders in the HANA space. So we definitely have made investments in technology and work with organizations in different various ways. Uh, but what we want to focus on today is really how uh, organizations really need to try to get leverage that technology and get the ROI on that investment. So that's where we're going to spend most of our time talking about because we have a program to make sure not only does the technology work, but the organization works within the technology and they begin to make sure that they're getting the benefits that they set out for when they built those business cases and they set on the journey of using the technology to add a strategic advantage or do different things that they felt that were strategic in the business. And that's really why we'd asked uh, Jim to join us today because we're looking at this from a high-level perspective from an executive is how are they able to use the technology to really add value to the business versus getting into a technical conversation about the, you know, the features of the technology per se. So Jim, I'll allow you to kind of introduce Edward Dunn. Sure, good. Thanks, Keith. Uh, good day, everybody. Uh, it's Jim Jones. I'm the COO and CFO at Don, and I, uh, just for legacy purpose, I've been here about 20 years, so way back fax machines were kind of the leading edge for us. Um, as a point of reference, IT also reports to me, which may be relevant as we're going through. And those of you who uh, may know Edward Don, it's a long-established Chicago-based company, a distributor of uh, equipment supplies. We did upgrade all of our systems during the recession, so uh, part of that upgrade was SAP. And... Uh, as you can see on the slide there, we've got pretty long tenured employees, uh, very dedicated, you know, high employee engagement. And, and during a project like this, uh, we'll touch on that a few times. So I think there's some implications to, to change management. Even when you perceive, you know, kind of a very engaged employee base, there's a lot to go on uh, kind of in a project of this scope. You'll see our products in most uh, food service establishments. And just as a point of reference, we have about $70 million in inventory. Uh, and you can see it's pretty much across the board of what you'd see in a food service establishment. Uh, one of the things we really pride ourselves on is, is kind of making our customers succeed. So, you know, our success is really tied to our customer's success. That hangs on the walls in all these buildings you see here. We're a national distributor. Um, with about, it's a little bit larger than that 1.3 million now as we continue to expand. We're, we're dealing pretty much with top-tier customers, 
uh, in the food service space, primarily through these six buildings uh, across the country. You can see we've put a lot of technology and innovation uh, and even automation on this slide here. So that, that really goes to the, uh, you know, the, the need for high productivity, both in asset terms as well as kind of the employees, uh, you know, number of cases per hour kind of thing. There's a very, very high service level requirement from our customer base, uh, and that drives kind of some of this inventory characteristics. As you can see, uh, you know, we have a very wide national distribution, really from those six distribution centers, go out to, to cross stocks kind of overnight with next day delivery into all these markets. Um, so it's a very, very uh, complicated kind of business for us from a distribution perspective. Thank you, Jim. It's good to just kind of get an overview to look a little bit about their, their business and some of the processes and how they really rely on technology to really innovate and help save costs. Uh, so we want to talk about is, you know, when we first started talking with Edward Don and, and get an understanding of the SAP footprint and some of the other technologies that they had inside, you know, how they were using it and maybe some of the challenges. So we're going to talk about that a little bit and go through kind of where we saw the gap uh, and what we consider to be the opportunity assessment. And, I, and I'll start off on this, and then I'll allow Jim to kind of put some his input in, in what he saw. But what we normally notice in a lot of organizations that, you know, the technology, you know, Jim talked about the fax machine, you know, you know several years ago. We, we've gotten to a point now where the technology in a lot of point has really outpaced our ability to leverage it. You know, most of the things that we need, the technology can do. And that's normally not the reason why we're not getting where we want to be. You know, we've gone such a far away, and SAP has made enormous investments and advancements in that. But what we start to see is that organizations still tr trouble uh, have trouble adopting that. So they begin to work in other systems, which will we'll give you a little overview of some of the things we saw here at Edward Don. The data, it, it becomes extremely important to manage it, not just from master data, but from transactional data, which causes some challenge. Uh, we begin to transact outside the plan, so we take the energy to create a forecast and a plan. But immediately we decide not, you know, we don't trust it and we do something uh, outside the system. So we have a tendency to have extensive workarounds, customizations, add different tools, bolt-ons, all these things that, that we've done. Uh, the reports don't become accurate, outdated, they're hard to get to, uh, a lot of importing, you know, exporting information, and then that causes a lot of uh, manual in intervention. So maybe, Jim, if you want to talk about some of the things that you might have saw at the beginning, and then what's your, uh, from the outcome of maybe some of the users and, and what they were challenged with? Yeah, I think from, from our perspective, or my, my perspective, you know, the CFO is kind of not happy with the turn. So, you know, when you, when you buy the big, you know, SAP, there's a lot of to be state that you've got to get to. And as we were kind of going through the, uh, you know, we had adopted it, we had it in for a couple of years, but I still wasn't happy with the turns. Um, one of the things we look at is Jim Roy, of course, numerator being the margin you get, denominator being what's the average inventory, that we had an awful lot of inventory around here that wasn't kind of uh, kind of up to speed. We knew the managers were kind of working around the system, and generally there was not a great deal of maybe even inventory conceptual understanding, like, like the linkage of demand patterns to what you're stocking. In some cases, it, it really didn't make sense. And you can see on the bottom of this slide, you know, those are the obvious problems and, and kind of the status you get with this, that, that you bought this big system and, and maybe you're not getting the outcomes you want. And certainly the, the senior management is, is kind of frustrated with, with we bought it, it should be working. So that, that was kind of where kind of the, the, the starting off point, and again, you can see on the bottom there, most of those things on the slide we were experiencing firsthand. So, I mean, obviously when we go through this process, you can't boil the ocean. So, as Jim had mentioned, really trying to focus on getting the right amount of inventory at the right time. Service level is important in this business. So, we needed to make sure we focused. And one of the things, and, and I'll have Jim elaborate on this, is, you know, this uh, using these other systems caused a, a single point of failure. So, exporting into this access program, trying to import that system back in, uh, caused a lot of uh, chaos and a lot of, uh, you know, people finding the information and, and having to make adjustments manually. Uh, maybe middle of understanding, and we'll talk about that a little bit of what, what SAP could do. So I don't know if you want to talk about some of the things that you try to do with regards to the scheduling of the vendors and the deliveries 
and then of course change management. And I can you know, add some yeah. additional. I, well, you know, the issue is that people are very comfortable with Excel and Access and these tools they use every day. So if if you ran into an issue, you you kind of took the data and maybe rekeyed it into Excel, looking for an answer. Um, and, and remember the starting off slide where we've got long service, well engaged people that are trying to do the right thing. And as you sit kind of in the throne here and look down, you see people working very very hard, and um, you, you kind of got to be very gentle walking through there because they're trying to do the right thing and maybe just are lacking really as you see the bullet points here, some of the fundamentals, and that's where we needed somebody to kind of come in and, and gently and, and, and politely uh, not disengage our employees, but kind of lead them to the more sort of the promised land. And that was really the kind of the change management side. So yes, these opportunities, we kind of knew those existed through the workarounds, but we couldn't necessarily put these kind of words to them. We'll talk about then, so as we begin to look at you know, where are the opportunities and what some of the targets, kind of about the program that we use to help you know, get them to, uh, towards those results that they were driving towards. So when I mentioned this at the beginning, you know, value harvesting is not the same as value engineering. So when you're out there looking for technology, SAP puts in a uh, kind of benchmark for what's happening in the industry to try to justify, hey, this is where you get the investment in the system which helps you identify, you know, a future target. What value engineer or value harvesting is really to then begin to get that value out of that investment. So they're different. One's an outside-in approach, and the other one is an inside-out approach. So in, in, as you kind of start the implementation, everybody has this you know, utopia between the system policies and the, and the user actions. And the goal is to try to get those as narrow as possible. And what happens over time as you go through later during implementation, that gap starts to happen, where what your the system policies and what do you put in the system and user actions become farther and farther apart. So a couple of these examples are, you know, the strategies and your safety stock, your lot size, your lead times, the MRP rules or forecasts, uh, any type of strategies, replenishment strategies, ATP, ATP, and then you've got these negative outcomes which we talked about before which other people beginning to use the system. So, you know, I guess you've been running the system for quite some time and finding this gap, you know, a little bit, which is really what our goal was to try to begin to nail well, that. You know, the issue anywhere is, you know, the, the management and the supervision, you know, they tend to get away from the day-to-day. -day, so, the, you know, the conceptual inventory turn should be working, uh, and you have this big system that should be doing it, and all of a sudden you go down there and somebody's working in Excel to do it. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of shocking, and, and you really can't mandate it from on high that they work in the system. And the other thing you find out is somebody someplace said, never run out of this product. And somebody goes in there and goes, you know, I'm going to jack up the safety stock three times, and they go into a, a system and just do it. So you don't know what you don't know, but you don't like the outcome being that you're sitting on way too much inventory. Absolutely. So you know, part of that is in the middle, right? What's that cost impact? So there's that access to inventory, potentially people trying to put in additional systems or other tools that begin to cost not only the IT cost to maintain that, but the inventory cost, the expediting costs, and those things. So, but again, from the police perspective, it's not necessarily cost. They're just somebody yelled at me yesterday. I don't want to get yelled at tomorrow. I can just go into the system because there's not enough visibility for management, and I'll jack a safety stock. Absolutely. So the goal is, and what we'll talk about it, where we begin to look and identify these things is really, that's what causes what we hear complexity in SAPs and talk about simplicity and trying to make it simple. But one of the reasons why things aren't simple is because of these issues, where we don't trust the data. Uh, we are you know, working really hard, but the system isn't working hard for us. So it's, the, it's that complexity that we've created because we're working you know, out sometimes outside the system and then having to record it back in the system versus them giving us proposals that we act upon. So the system should tell us what we need to do and then we react to that so we can really become more efficient. So that's really what that ultimate goal is when we talk about value harvesting. You know, and, and it isn't something that happens overnight. I mean, this is a, an evolutionary process uh, that we are, the way we start is we have to take a look at the data, and, and we'll talk about this, and Jim will share some of the experiences when he saw the information in the system, but this is really where the rubber hits the road 
when the data should tell you really where the opportunities are. Because a lot of organizations, they know that this is happening, but may not be able to pinpoint exactly why. Uh, but then you need to enable the system. So at some particular point, there were some, some settings, some other tools that we need to get back into SAP. And then we'll talk about how we activated the team and the users. So now we have the system working. Now we need to enable the team. And then we can begin to evolve. Then we can begin to accelerate. And that's really where we can take something now that's, that's been optimized and really take it to the next level. And then there's an ongoing process. And this isn't a one-time thing. And we'll talk about that a bit more as, as Jim has put a, a team in now to make sure that they continue this process and evolve versus starting and, and having to do this o over again. Because you want to make sure you're leveraging the efforts that you put in. So. What we have to look at when we go through that, and in, in addition to the data, and we find a lot of organizations where the people are very knowledgeable, uh, but the system may not be quite there yet. So they're finding trouble where the technology is slow, it isn't necessarily up to speed, maybe the process really aren't mapped, but the users are saying, we want more and we need to, to leverage this, you know, get additional technology. And they're basically constrained by the technology. And the opposite way was when the people really, you have all the technology that you need, but the people don't necessarily know how to use it. So it's really where we don't know what we don't know. And then we have an optimized the processes to, to meet those two because there is that gap. And I think, Jim, this is maybe where you felt where... Well, I think this is the artistry of it all. I mean, you've got to, you know, as you're kind of leading the orchestra, make sure that everybody's kind of keeping up. Uh, I think, you know, actually you guys are very valuable in this. Is, is you know, you, you bought the right you know, the tools can do what you're doing, is maybe your people aren't aren't uh, trained well enough or they, they really don't understand the outcomes well enough, but there's an absolute need to consider all these three and, and kind of the pace of progress. Um, you know, if these three, three get misaligned, uh, uh, you know, it's almost a, a, a really hard to get them back in, in shape. And as Jim said, I mean, the, the people will work in really hard and it was a matter of them giving them the tools that they needed to, to make sure. And, and of course, it, as they're growing, the choices are that we add more people or we make sure that the technology can manage that more effectively. So really, it's trying to get those three aligned so as you begin to evolve that they align together. Where, in addition, we've heard you know, some organizations where they say, hey, we've made a lot of investment in the technology, but we're just not moving to it. So we've got to get those three in alignment. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on this, and, and I think uh, it's kind of really where the rubber hits the road a little bit, is, is we're looking into the system, and what we find that a lot of organizations haven't been able to find where these issues are because they're exporting into Excel or using a lot of other tools. These are some standard reports that are available in the system. And if you look at the top one, you know, this is a, an example of a material that has a lot of movement on it, but uh, what we in SAP, meaning that amount that never turns. So this is really where you're not making money off that dead inventory. So what is it that's causing the reason why we're holding it up? Maybe it's the fact that we're not trusting it or we're afraid we're going to stock out or whatever those reasons are. The other one, you know, we have high deviation in the process. So we have another situation where we're actually running out. And the other one is where we have different lot sizes and frequencies. So you've got a supplier bringing one enormous lot in at one period of time, and then a smaller lot. I mean, it's got to be hard for the warehouse managers to manage what's coming in, when's it coming in, and why are we uh, ordering things that way? So, I wonder if you want to talk about. Well, I think this slide, you know, and, and certainly these graphs, when, when you know, live we saw them. Really, for me, finally, finally, this is what we were looking for: a, 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 a graphical il illustration of this is what we thought were happening. And as we talked to our our buyers, you could see the nodding. Well, of course, that item is really volatile. Or, or I got yelled at, so there I jacked up the safety stock, and I can see it in, in, in the top slide there. But really kind of put our finger on the issue, and I think um, as the, the kind of staff looked at all these, yeah, we all kind of realized something needs to change here because there's a lot of uh, kind of misalignment of inventory to and maybe overinvestment of inventory, and that there are tools we can use that we do already own that uh, kind of can get to the answer. And certainly with senior management, kind of uh, you know, kind of an eye on the on the prize here. Uh, everybody finally kind of understood 
this was kind of the, the pivotal slide for us, basically. And it also kind of creates action, right? You know, where you want to focus and start to be able to help the team. Well, again, when you the team is beginning to nod, going, oh, yeah, that's one I should look at. Absolutely. So then this is another one we looked at trending, right? Or do we have a seasonal model? And, and what this graph is illustrating is really where our top line there is what our evaluated inventory is versus our usage. So over time, they're looking at a trending pattern. There is some seasonality, but that gap is getting uh, farther and farther apart. That means that we're actually you know, we're, we're selling less than we're bringing in, and that's really where you start to begin identifying some of that dead stock and this inventory rising. Yeah, well, that's a big number for us is this fatty growth. You know, sales are growing 9% and inventory growing 10%. You can project that out to, you know, the operations side of me says, I'm running out of room in the warehouse. The financial guy's saying, i got to turn this inventory faster. So, you know, but for new items coming in, that inventory should begin to be more efficient, and that's really one of the goals. Certainly at the, at the more management level, we understood that was a, a, certainly an opportunity in this. Okay. So this uh, kind of helps us look also at what if we need to put different types of forecast models in that could reflect how the inventory was, you know, being purchased for seasonal, and to make sure that we can prepare for that. But that set that vision out by having that historical information. So we'll talk about this, uh, kind of introduce. So what do we, we talked about analyzing the information? So we showed some in the graph to say, okay, where do we want to focus our energies, and what are the ones that have the most opportunity? Because they're an exercise like this. You, know, you want to see that quick return to value. So where's that low-hanging fruit? Where's that opportunity? But in a service-driven business, we have to make sure that we focus on our service levels as our top priority. So the goal is to, one, what items and what areas can, because uh, Edward Don has over 30,000 SKUs, so you can't do everything at, at one time, and then begin to find a way to trust the system and stabilize. So once we get some stabilization, then we can start to push that down because we know that we trust the system, its settings are right, the people understand that what they need to do, and then we can start to optimize. Mm -hmm. So there is a little bit of a learning curve and a trust factor that you need to go through to make sure that we have what we need to satisfy our customer demand. So it is a process uh, that we need to go through. Yeah, and for us, I mean, the, the, the three words, what, what I would call the first one was kind of enlightenment, because we did suspect there was trouble in, in this analyzing phase was, what the aha moment for a lot of people. The stable item I get in the buy-in, some early successes, we knocked off a few items, and, uh, you know, the metrics kind of came back in line. And then the third thing for us is build routine around it. So once we have enlightenment, we saw some buy-in, this had some traction, can we can we make this routine at, at not necessarily the highest paid people in the business, give them the kind of the professional pride in building routines around this that we don't go back. Let's go through the program, and, and we can you know, talk about what we needed to do to get them to, the, to that goal. And we talked about the sampling, so you know, going into the system and looking at where, where the, we needed to focus our energies and set out our targets. So part of that exercise was to say, where do we need to be, and what are our, at the end of a certain period of time, what are our goals? And we, you know, Jim can comment, you know, as we kind of wrap up towards where he sees they're at and, and as we begin to move towards those targets. And then we need to enable the system. So I'm going to show there real quickly what the system looked like and what we needed to do to kind of get that back into SAP. And then we'll go through the educational program. And uh, Jim has an opportunity to sit in some of those sessions so we'll get some feedback from him. And then maybe uh, talk about what they're looking to do from Edward Don and maybe some things in the future to, to continue to try to optimize that. So this, in, in, in kind of from a high-level view, was what the system looked like before. So they had the Z process and a custom MRP report, which was really taking information from SAP, dumping it into an access program to kind of rerun MRP, to do a manual printout to take a look at what they needed to buy, send the buyer printouts, uh, determine whether or not they wanted to apply it or purchase it, uh, then there was a lot of emailing and then using some external reports from a supplier performance. So I know that there was some initial resistance when we talked about this about getting people to give this up because it is what they knew and there's some comfortableness even though it may not be optimized, but people know what they know. Yeah, and, and I, 
you know, again, you're sitting in the, the ivory tower. You don't realize all this stuff is happening. But, you know, in any system, we, you know, when we went live, we also had some AR, frankly, where people were printing out agents and calling from the agent. So we had to go through a process there. So you don't realize exactly what's happening in the trenches. So in a lot of systems, people export, um, and you simply don't realize they're doing this work. The issue for our staff, of course, is you're taking away something that that's the safety blanket, and it's mid-flight, and i got to get my turns up, and I can't use access anymore. I mean, so the, the starting off is, like, no way. I'm, I'm not doing this. So it's really kind of the as-is kind of state. And, and people are so familiar with these tools on the right. That seems to be the answer to a lot of things. And, and this leads to a tremendous amount of change management. If I was to lean on, you know, beyond your guys' expertise is really the change management side of this. That is a certainly 50% of the pie here, is getting people to do the things you want to do because it's the right thing. So the, the goal was really... How can we migrate that back into standard SAP? When it's going back to what we talked about between that gap is where we saw that gap and the way to begin to look for efficiency was to get the alignment between the system, those behaviors into one system. So the, at the end of the enablement phase, we were able to retire a lot of those manual processes, retire those access systems and Excel systems. And you can talk about maybe the process and where the team is at now. Well, I think you know one of the things on this was uh, you know, when you lay out the project for people and they see, whatever it was, six weeks later, we're going to cut these things off. That was where fear came in their eyes, that we're going to train you enough that you can get back into SAP that you're going to lose the right side and we're going to, management was just going to cut it off. So there was kind of this burning platform you've got to get over. And there's where the change management is important. Absolutely. And part of it is, is, is that what we didn't know what we didn't know. So there were uh, a process where they want to have certain suppliers deliver certain times. So it was a matter of just setting up the the, uh, the calendars in the system for being able to do that, right? So we needed to make sure that we had the settings right. It was a matter of they didn't maybe understand that SAP could do some of these things. So we needed to find a way to get it done. We're going to get it done. And then when we work with them and saying, well, this is a standard SAP setting, we can help you put that into the system. And there was a lot of that aha moment. We're saying, well, we just didn't know that the system could do that. So once those decisions were made and we were able to get the system to the point where it needed to be, and there's other things that we set up, such as coverage profiles and, and different ways to set up different MRP rules. And we came together from a leadership team, working with uh, Jim's leadership team, to make these strategic decisions, to put them in the system, and then we needed to take it to the team. And we set up these sessions, what we call active learning sessions, and if you look at the, the, the picture at the front of the room, is uh, that's their you know, director of supply chain who's really helping drive this. So I know, Jim, you may want to comment on some of the, uh, you participate in some of these sessions and sure. some feedback. Well, I mean, the, 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 certainly the success here is very dependent on all those groups. Um, we all, you know, have been leaders over time, and you kind of mandate things down, and it can't be the flavor of the month. So, so you you got to kind of pick your battle. So, we certainly needed buy-in, and you also, you know, from project management perspective, you need a, a champion, uh, an on the on the ground kind of champion. Certainly, senior management, we said, you know, got to improve turns, and we got to improve our DSOs, but wishing it doesn't get it done. The the key thing here is uh, getting leadership in the room that people trust, that uh, you know, he's intelligent, and, and really holistically caring for the folks. The, 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 the teams here, one of the things we did is we brought up all of our regional purchasing people into Chicago. So this is you know, some of the first time these people in Florida met our people in Chicago that met some of the other people, uh, supply chain managers that deal directly with customers. So this was this, this, this kind of summit of bringing everybody together, which indicated to a lot of people, and Al May is there, that this is a serious project now. And again, with the, you know, I, I kind of sat in the back there. So you could see how much interaction was going on. It was really a highly energized room. Again, kind of a war room that, uh, you know, as you've implemented ERP packages, it kind of that, that sense of urgency was in the room, which was, uh, you know, incredibly powerful, almost self-sustaining. People, once they get in the mode here, 
uh, we're kind of pushing the ball down the field. So I guess from a comment, we talked about the difference between SAP training that your team may have been through when they learned how to transact. Can you comment maybe that Well, I, I, I think, you know, to our discredit probably is, you know, that was eating the whole elephant at once. So the idea is you're trying to move, um, you know, uh, 1,200 people down the field all at once. This is much more refined. This was uh, really targeting in on people's, uh, you know, what were the hurdles to their, their ability to get something done. If somebody really didn't understand inventory management, at the end of the day, they always taught hit key F1, then hit F3, and then hit enter and execute. This gives you, this was really stepping all the way back on what is inventory management? How do you, how do you, how do you make your customers succeed from an inventory purchasing? And how do I link the activities I'm doing today to the success of the business overall? And having senior management, and a couple with you guys, you know, kind of a gentle touch going through it all, um, kind of got us to the, to the end line. This is a much more, uh, uh, you know, focused, deep, much, much deeper uh, understanding of the system than we had probably on the whole ERP. Thanks, sir. Here's just one other thing this because I think this was a lot of uh, aha moments from the team. What was the kind of general attitude after they learned a lot of this? Was it well, the funny thing was, you know, one of the things you guys came up with is make them present their own department or their own area, their product line. And, you know, some people certainly knew their product line but just had never made a public presentation in their life. And the idea of taking the pride in getting up in front of people and saying what they did taking accountability and knowing they're going to come back in two weeks and explain the outcomes again. I think we turned some, yeah, maybe some people who didn't have a lot of career passing into fairly professional people now. So they took a great deal of pride in the outcome. And it's different than just, I have to go to training today. The approach was much different in front of very senior bosses. That's what it was. So the next is putting in the right KPI. So we, we had to look at the KPIs that were going to measure the success. And I think sometimes, you know, you get on that journey and then you look back and think, well, did we succeed? So we wanted to be clear that we those targets of what was the success measure. And, you know, this could be any tool. We happen to provide a tool for the team to begin to track that success and the trending and looking at whether or not we're sustaining it, we're pushing it forward, and we provided that. You know, it could be any tool that you want to use. But I think what's more important there is what are some of the health measures that we began to look at, and then uh, maybe Jim, you can comment on a little bit about how you continue to sustain this, and what are the measures that you're looking for. But you know, looking at those things like those red traffic lights, the service level impact, the exceptions, and these are things that we wanted to make sure we set that ground level to how we've enabled the team through the education. We told them what we what needed to be done, but how well they continue to sustain that. Well, I think the, the idea is, obviously, the, the folks coming from Excel and Access didn't have this kind of data. There's not alerts. There's not red is bad, green is good. So seeing some of this, um, you know, for the first time, I think that the team was, was, this is, kind of quote, this is easier. This is actually easier at, at this level. They also, I, I think competition kind of started to creep in between different buying groups and different geographies of the country because we could begin to develop uh, kind of scorecards by buyer, by supplier, and one of the things we did is we started, you know, the, the team started publishing it and jabbing each other, you know, who had less red lights today than the other people, and you start getting this uh, culture of kind of uh, excellence, you know, trying to kind of move the bar up almost daily. So I think the, the illustration of showing people, you, you know this, this problem is happening offline, Here's where it is on this screen. If you look at this screen, this red light is your problem. If you turn that to green by doing these activities, you won't have that problem tomorrow. That's in, incredibly enlightening to our staff. So would you find, I guess one of the things, too, is obviously you start training and educate people. There's a little more effort, but at some point, they want to get out of that transaction and start using the exception reminded management and using the tools. They begin to start seeing themselves really have an assistant help as they drive. Well, I think there's ownership. I mean, finally, you know, I, 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 I've heard, you know, that somebody say, you know, I'm fixing the same problem day after day after day after day after day. 
and the salesman that's dealing on customer X is yelling at me day after day after day because the system was never set up correctly in the first place. So you will get red lights from now till you retire unless you get over there and set something correctly in the setup. I think that's where people, light bulbs went up. That's how you make this thing sustainable. So I guess what we want to talk about here is really, and this is a gardener, we're not, I'm not going to read through this, but really talking about how we put in that center of excellence so we maintain this. We've taken the effort to put the right settings in the system, educate the team, put the measures, but how do we make sure we don't go backwards and we continue to not only sustain it, but look at ways to innovate moving forward. And I know you put it actually an individual in yeah. place that you move to make sure that you put the structure in and set it up, or if you want to talk about the center of excellence. And, and well, I mean, it, that's it, a, a kind of a notion for us. It was, uh, you know, what do you leave behind? Because you know the, you know, the next flavor of the month. You know, we jump into something else now. So, what do you leave behind for these people that you invested all this time in? And and what we we decided was we took a fairly senior um, person that would hurt the department we're taking out of. You don't take one of your tired old people. You take an expert and you take somebody that has some leadership skills and charisma and you put him, we did in our case, left him back in the department, created a new job that that really becomes the the the, the project uh, deliverable guy that he is the he is there to respond to questions. He is there to prod. If he sees something in a system, because he kind of sits on the lifeguard station looking over everybody, and um, it's kind of the, the I think it's, it's part of the, the the tuition of this thing is you have got to leave some expertise behind because it's a change management, and people will tend to, if they haven't routinized this thing, it will slip. So the idea was we go down this path, and you guys pointed it out early on, you're going to have to leave somebody in there to make this sustainable. So... We, we left one of our best and brightest, uh, an A player, so that's kind of the commitment. Somebody that that, that takes a great deal of pride in, in continuing the, the success of the project and really kind of burn the project in. And we, and we continue to get notes from from the sound who's driving this about things he's looking to say, now we we're able to do this and we're going to try to do this. We're going to continue to try to move that and prove it. The slide we saw, showed before about really beginning to optimize and taking that pride on knowing that he also has got senior leadership behind him to help continue to support that. So just a couple of things as we wrap up, we'll go into a little bit of a discussion uh, area here. But you know, part of what we look for is you've got to create that uh, cultural learning, not a, a individual heroes. And we have people that we send to an SAP training class, we send them to a seminar, we send them somewhere, they come back all fired up with all this information that they know. And it falls on deaf ears. And it just becomes frustrated because they know they can do things better. So you've got to create that culture. Right? You know, that knowledge creates the confidence, behavior change, and excitement, but it has to be supported within an environment that can actually do something and act upon it. Right? It's got to be uh, done in relevant life situations, not in the demo classroom. So we did the, the work, what we did on the system, and looking at information in real time and act upon to improve the business. And that wasn't done in a demo type of a classroom. It's got to be done cross-functional. You saw the teams that were sitting there in the training room. There were uh, representatives from different areas of the business. It wasn't just in purchasing. It was the different areas of planning and understanding how to collaborate. If you do this, this is what impacts the change. And leadership saying, here's what we're looking for and here's what we're measuring. So those are some things that, that we got to make sure that we put in place. Uh, we want to make sure we create a, a culture of nimble change where we can now react to it so that data stays fresh and we're maintaining lead times, we're training, maintaining the things that are going to affect the system and keeping it clean versus that beginning to go backwards in the other direction. Okay, And there was a lot of folks, I think the last one here, in this organization, as Jim mentioned, that were very tenured. It was just a matter of how we get that knowledge and use it and leverage it in the system. I don't know if you want to comment on any of these key points. Well, I think, you know, it, in any project of this kind of nature, it's, it's critical, you know, to pick the kind of the three things for us would be pick the right team, pick the right time, and pick the right partner. You know, taking these kind of things on ourselves, I've learned over the years, you know, we got all day jobs, so the idea of trying to move this on our own, um, you know, we, we would not be successful. The timing is never right because everybody's busy. So, uh, you know, you, you got to 
kind of pick the right partner that, that you know, aligns culturally with, with what you're trying to do. Again, you've got very engaged, dedicated people, and the last thing you want them to do is feel small about themselves. So, um, you know, we were very happy with, 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 with a patient but disciplined partner that, you know, had some flexibility giving, given acknowledging the long tenure of our people. So I, I think somewhere along the way here, this project magically became uh, ours, and, uh, you know, the, our partners here kind of began to take a little bit of a back seat, but every now and then would just come up and kind of touch us on the shoulder, and, you know, this, this has to move a little quicker. You know, the discipline was good, but it's absolutely about... Uh, you know, picking the right team and time and partner. So, you know, the future is not written yet. So now, you know, where's that opportunity to begin to build that roadmap, align those people, processes, and technology, and begin to move those together? So just kind of in summary of some of the things that we cover. So, you know, we, I guess I mentioned that technology evolves faster than sometimes we can evolve to grow. We've got to address those three areas, in which we hear all the time with the people, the process, and technology, but it is important that we move those needles those need together and begin to simplify and build a roadmap of the things that we need to focus on first as we, as we also set that future goal where we want to go. I do, I do think it took us, you know, again, the timing is pretty important. Uh, if we would have done this earlier, I don't think people would have recognized had the, had the history of problems, wouldn't understand the opportunity. So, you know, we had a couple of years of stumbling through Excel and all this stuff to, to really realize how much, how much work we had to do here. And I think that helped certainly in the change management that, that the team needed to come together here. So what I want to do is we want to go through just a couple of quick questions and then we'll leave it open for a Q&A with the audience if we have any questions. But you know, I wanted to ask Jim just a few things to give us some feedback overall as, uh, as he kind of participated from a, an executive level with this whole effort. But you know, I guess from today, you know, why did you decide to do this program and are you satisfied with the results that you've seen today? Well, distributors, you know, we only have a couple of real assets. Uh, you know, hard assets, and that's accounts receivable and inventory. That is what, what we manage, and, and we don't want a lot of fatty growth, frankly. Uh, we had gone through uh, kind of accounts receivable, and our directors there kind of engaged in a similar program, and we had kind of remarkable results in that systems today are built with, with a lot of the current problems in mind. That, and if you use a system appropriately, you're probably getting some good outcomes. I think the AR experience showed us what we can do on the inventory side. Certainly inventory, we knew, uh, boy, we're not optimized at all, and there was a lot of outside influences. It just didn't feel right. Um, so that's what, what got us all kind of thinking about, are we at the right team, right time, and, and who can help us through this? Because we certainly can't do this on our own. So how about the importance of senior leadership such as yourself to kind of be a part of this program and driving this type of, a, of initiative? Well, you know, you only have so much time in the day, and, and, and you know, this is fairly, you know, time-consuming for our people. And, again, you got to ship orders out that night. So, so if, indeed, you're going to take on a project like this, I do think you need certainly somebody on the ground that's a champion that's going to see it through. they got to be aligned. Uh, the team that was on this, the, the, the senior team that kind of ran this, uh, working with you guys, were 20-year veterans here. So they really knew the business. Uh, former controller was on the project. So you got to sit, you got to kind of commit as senior leadership to sit in there, listen to it. People in the rows are kind of like looking over their shoulder because you're in the back that this is a serious project. The message is absolutely clear. When we devoted bringing you know staff up here for that length of time for training, we're serious. So we say you had some pushback kind of at first as you started this. Well, I or think people are very comfortable it? with their tools. You know, this is my blanket. You're taking it away, and you're going to force me to do something else. Line fill is not my problem anymore. You know, again, you have engaged employees, so you got to. Very, very gently, and, and you guys did a good job, of, of, of this is the way 
SAP and, and more sophisticated companies, frankly, do it. And, and you know, while that sounds like a hard message, I think the method of delivering it was a little easier. And, uh, you know, it, it's change management. I would say today, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're never satisfied kind of thing. But, you know, our, our terms are, are getting more respectable. We, the Jim Roy's are starting to feel right. There's areas that we see that still have some influences from a, either a salesman or a large customer that says, I need 12 weeks on hand all the time. So we got to go in there and kind of tease those things out still. But I think you've built a pretty, or we built a pretty good routine um, that, that puts us on a pretty good path for success now. Or would you share any significant wins that you would say from, from the program? Uh, you know, our terms are up about one. That's a big spin of inventory when you got $70 million. So in terms of cash flow, we've, we've freed up. I think our service levels are a little more, um, there's no erosion in our service levels. So I think we've pulled out some cash off the balance sheet that, that really, uh, financially, that was kind of this, what we signed up for with the team. I think the buyers are, are feeling a little more confident, feeling a little more proud. Uh, this is their project. I, I see them having lunch together now. And I see them, the, the inventory manager has actually the scoreboard up in his office. So, that, so if you're on the lower end of the score, you're kind of pointing at the other team and saying, we're, we're killing you guys now. So there's a little more competition. I think people are paying much more attention to what was kind of ignored in the past, to tell you, at the departmental level. There's much more teaming going on. I guess that, you know, one of the questions I think you might have asked this a little bit is, you know, do you think this is something you could have done on your own, I'm sure those questions probably come up as you begin this process. Well, I think you continue to sustain the improvement. We all think we can, but you know, you have day jobs, and time runs out, and um, it, it's just awful, awful hard to do that. I think certainly the executive level, we dream up stuff all the time, but the next thing is find that internal champion, and then you you, you kind of with the internal champion. And again, we have good open dis discussion here. Most times, they, uh, I don't, I can't, I can't, I need some help. Let me do a little research and figure out who can work with us here that can culturally fit in in the kind of the mode of working with Edward Don. So I think it's aw awful, awfully hard to take on a large scale program yourself. Again, most of us are staffed pretty thin since the recession, and you know we we're not, we don't have a lot of access overhead here. So I, yes, I guess it's a short answer, and I'm not, not necessarily an ad, an ad, but if you're going to take this on and seriously try to, to, to take a transformational kind of project on, I think it, 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 the likelihood of success doing it yourself is pretty low. I guess what we'll do is we'll, uh, we kind of just have about 10 minutes left as we'll open up some opportunity for some from Q&A from the audience, and if anybody... Angie has had some questions, and then there's a couple of things that we can wrap up as we uh, as we get close to our, our end of our time here. So, do we have any additional questions? From we do, audience? we do. And while you're answering these, if anybody else has any questions, please feel free to submit them. Um, we have one that said, "Did you have to increase the staff to manage the process process improvement initiative?" Uh, the answer is no. Actually, we realigned the staff. So if we had a bunch of people kind of punching out purchase orders every day, what we did is some people were more bent to being analysts. So they're kind of abstract thinkers, understood the concepts, and that group, and, and Keith, correct me here, that group kind of morphed over to more planning, analytics, uh, less tactical execution. So we didn't add any overall head count, but we certainly leaned on what was an innate skill set of the people and allowed them to do the tasks I think they, they aspired to do. And again, some people probably, you know, you know, would prefer just to execute POs and go home. So those people, we had them in less critical analytical roles. Yeah, I would agree. I think they, the excitement that they can get out of the tactical and actually begin to look more strategic and how to improve the business versus just run the things that are necessary day to day to get inventory in we began to see that transition, and I would say there was definitely some satisfaction of that. I would say the uh, the fellow that we left for the Center of Excellence was new to the department. He actually, I think, relocated 
from Florida back to Chicago. Part of that was management development. He's a really um, uh, you know, exceptional young person, and we wanted to give him a little more exposure. He had uh, kind of mentioned that he was looking to get a little more involved on the inventory side. So he came in, I think, one of the second or third guy on the project. So, uh, you know, he had certainly an inventory background and had worked in our DCs before. So he was the only new one, and uh, we're, we probably will leave him in there probably at least another 18 months or so and then rotate him out, and hopefully somebody on the team there would step up into that uh, center of excellence role. We have another question. Thank you so much, um, Jim. How is the removal of Excel and Access managed, and were licenses removed? Uh, you know, I don't really know. I don't think we cut licenses because we have some enterprise agreement. But I, I think the, the the peer pressure, I suppose, the way we're, you know, like most companies, you, you're, they're all kind of sitting around in an in a, in a, in a area together, that um, it became... Um, not cool to be using Excel, and some of the cool kids on the block were the ones that were using the system here, and I think they took great pride in going over and saying, you know, you don't necessarily need to do that. Let me show you how it's working uh, if you use this other process. So I think it became kind of a uh, in vogue to, to not be using uh, Access and Excel. And in fact, I think the Certainly our director was, was up and down the rows there going, how's it going? Let's try it this way. I think the way you guys turned, I'm talking to Keith here, the way you turned on the project was, was uh, more rationed out. It wasn't like a big bang, if I remember right. And I, and I think one of the big things was the support on IT. They have a lean IT staff. So there's a lot on their plate, and the ability to remove and support this was also another thing that we saw. So maybe not a licensing from Excel or Access because you have enterprise license, but it was the support of Another, any other questions, Andy? Yep. Uh, there's a few more here. Was this perceived by people as an IT project or a business project? That's a great question because one of the things that I have the luxury of being here as long as I have is I never have an IT project. I never start an IT project. I never start a project without a champion from the business that says I want to do this. So our IT department, as Keith said, it's, it's you know they're solid citizens and been around a long time, but they know that if it comes out of IT, boy, it's it's, it's the lifespan can be fairly short. What what I think you got to do is you you, you kind of got to get that senior sponsorship working with an absolute internal champion that would rather die than give up on this project and then get an outside person, because this person will die trying to do the project, get somebody outside to kind of assist you that culturally fits. You know, there, there's there's plenty of big consulting firms that, um, you know, I've worked with over my career that, you know, it's kind of my way or the highway. So so you got to make sure that you, you if you're going to take this on, um, you you absolutely have to pick the right partner, and it can't be an IT project, my opinion. Wonderful. This next one is um, a combination of three questions. How long after initial go live did the business realize there was a problem? What was the key trigger that identified the problem? And then how long did it take to see a turnaround of the inventory issues? Um, you know, Sometimes you don't know you have a problem. And, and, you know, any company going live on SAP, you're kind of, you know, firefighting for a while. So I was, I was tending to pay more, the most attention to where the most problems were in customer-facing things. So as we went live, you know, making sure the invoices are printing and labels are getting out and all that other stuff, you can't, we frankly didn't pay attention to inventory as much. Mine fill was okay. As we start closing the books and you look at inventory, you go, well, this is the performance dip of going live. We're over inventory for a while. I get it. And you get kind of lazy, frankly, we did, that, um, you know, it, it's not the, the squeakiest problem right now, so we allowed that inefficiency, like I said, probably for a couple of years before we, we realized we ought to be doing something. Our focus probably was more on AR right off the bat, making sure the DSO and uh, inventory was more complicated, 
because the Excel and Access and all that other stuff. So uh, I would say probably two years after Go Live, we were like, boy, there's a lot of inventory sitting around, and probably another year after that of flailing ourselves at what would, what can we do about this before we we actually had uh, uh, kind of the director of supply chain get get some legs under him with a high kind of a high level program of how how we should attack this. And I would say, you know, we're not done yet, clearly. So is inventory under control? No, we we fill, fill you know, line fills great and inventory is turning a little faster. But uh, until you hit 30,000 SKUs pretty hard, I don't think we'll ever feel like we're done, as most CFOs on the phone are going to say. You're never quite done with this. You know, we have internal benchmarks, one team against another, and as we continually improve uh, and publish those outcomes, we, we, we think we're on the right path and getting things uh, improved, and certainly the financials are showing it. Wonderful. Thank you. And Keith, I had um, forwarded a couple questions to you. I think you hit on most of them, but did you have any okay. other ones that we didn't get to? I think we're probably good. We, we've got about a minute or two, so we best to wrap up, but I will say that Jim will be down at, at Sapphire as well, and I'll get to that in a minute and show the presentation we'll be doing with uh, one of our other team members. But you know, one of the things, too, we get is, you know, how does this help with our roadmap towards uh, HANA? Because a lot of organizations are looking to move now towards that technology. But these fundamentals, these are areas that need to be addressed if we're really going to begin to leverage that. So this is part of that roadmap, in that making sure that if we move to technology that we're going to continue to get the investment out of that. And then if you're interested, we have something which is a self-evaluation tool. So you you have an opportunity to go through and ask yourself some internal questions and kind of get an idea where you're at if some of these areas might have an opportunity for your improvement. It'd be a great conversational tool with your organization. Feel free to go ahead and do that. And then as I mentioned, uh, Jim will be speaking with Rodney Dawson from our team down at Sapphire. So those of you that might be down there, he'll be available also on Wednesday at the KPIT booth if you want to come by and, and meet him. Uh, their presentation is Wednesday from 12.45 to 1.45. So if you're uh, interested, you can uh, definitely check that out. I have others in the organization that may not have been able to meet, today, meet uh, or join for the webinar. Uh, 